what we're going to talk about today is I'm going to have um, what you would call a brain or a brain adjacent surgery. <laughs> um, it's not quite into my brain meat. I don't know what you're supposed to brain call it. Meat? I don't know. What do you call that? <laughs> brain stuff? mass? I don't brain know. mass. Brain mass. I kind of like brain meat, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Calling it a mass seems so unfriendly. I guess you don't even feel it. I guess they give me local drugs where they cut into my grind. Okay. And then they send a little a local anesthesia up my veins like that. Wacky inflatable tube man style <laughs> all the way up to the top. <laughs> and then just blowgun dart some little metal sheets in there and close her up, boys. You did not that. need that visual of the blow dart. <laughs> Plop me over to this table and I'm no jokes, Bex. They strap me in. They strap this, they strap this, this delicate little flower of a lady to the table. How many and, straps um, are we talking? At least legs, three. chest, three legs, chest, one. and head. Head, head. head. That's disgusting that your head well, had to be strapped in. And then they put me in like... this like tube thing, so I couldn't move my arms. Like all I could do was like really oh move my hand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I was like, "That's odd feeling." And then they're going up, they're going up, they're going up, and all of a sudden, I just hear this like pop. And I can tell that's the noise of him getting into my brain, which is just the weirdest sensation because. Also, why did there have to be a pop? Be your own advocate. If you cannot be your own advocate, bring somebody with you that can. Um, Take Mm. notes, ask questions. If something doesn't feel right, ask more. And you can look at these days and you can think of why it sucks and why you're so unlucky and and why life is so hard on you. And you can also take it from that perspective of like, I am so lucky to have this time. I am so lucky to look at my life with perspective in a different way. Like I'm so lucky to have family with me. Hi everyone. How's your week going? What are you doing? Right now, we're doing We're Experts Now. I'm your host, Rebecca Buckley. I'm Jackie, and I was not aware until now that we were doing the podcast. Oh, (laughs) shoot. (laughs) Now you know. Now you're on board. (laughs) I was here. I was ready to do another week with you, Bex. Uh, Anything sounds like a good time to me. How you been? What you been up to? I've been, I've been doing a lot of comedy, been hitting the mics hard, been doing some open mics and some closed mics, AKA shows, because I booked it, starting the year strong. Oh yeah, it's been good, it's been good, it's been fun getting, I had a little mini uh, viral pop on one of my videos, my reels, so you know that always feels good, yeah. Yes, you know, and then immediately someone uh, did say that it didn't mean anything and doesn't matter. And I was like, it's good. I feel like, you know, you've done something right when someone's mad about it. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. That is the always like you're not doing it right unless someone's mad at you. Wow. Well, that sounds uh, pretty fun. You know, I'm always proud of you for getting out there and doing all that stuff that you do. Um, it sounds interesting and terrifying all at the same time um but what else what else do you mean hey well, actually hasn't... go ahead i was gonna say it hasn't all been you know bright shining celebrity moments for me over here i have my my amateur alerts as well so well yeah what happened when i came down there to visit you i, I think we went on some adventures that were were pretty fun but maybe maybe not where we were going I tried to schedule us the adventure of a lifetime, Jackie, and found out that I procrastinated and we basically didn't get to do it. But I, in my head, okay, I was so going to schedule it. <laughs> there was no scheduling if we. <laughs> but in my mind, in my mind's calendar, my eye calendar, mm-hmm. yep. I was shopping for a new member of my family, a fur baby, and thought that I could, well, I had known about the cat cafe, which had been recommended to me to go visit some cats, play with them, take one home. I thought getting a cat would be so easy. I thought you could just pluck one from any dumpster in Hollywood, 
But well, you can't I, do that too. <laughs> well, I guess I could, should have done that, but I wanted a, a fancy cat and I yeah, yeah. was going to, in my mind, I was like, oh, it'll be perfect timing. I'll pick Jackie up from the airport. We'll go to the cat cafe. We'll pick up a cat. We'll gra- grab some tuna and milk and we'll be home by dinner. You know, I thought that's how it was all going to go. And I was very <laughs> excited and um, I have two for babies, my little, my little best friend munchkins that run around my house. Uh, I'm living that cat mom life. So when you tell me, Hey, Jackie, we're coming, you're coming to LA. We're going to hang out. We're going to go see some kitty cats and you do not bring me to see some (laughs) kitty cats. Well, it turns out you have to pay and make the appointment for the cat cafe, but you also have to pass a screening process, which takes three to five business days, as it turns out, and apparently longer since COVID times. And it was, of course, this was Christmas time. So New Year's, yeah. New Year's, New Year's, yeah. So just after Christmas time. So everyone's getting cats, you know. And I, so learning that, I was like, okay, plan A dashed, didn't have a plan B. Then we started looking at every shelter in the area, which was closing for holiday hours yeah. for New Year's Eve. Mm-hmm. And which we discovered New Year's Eve and New Year's Day are both holidays. Well, and we were both. Well, the holiday is New Year's. This. I was okay. like. Well, that's what you said. And I said the whole, no, I said New Year's Day. You yes. said New Year's Eve. Yes. And, I and learned. we were both wrong and both right, which I do love <laughs> for us. But So that sort of th- thwarted my plans of just going to a shelter and picking up a shelter cat. And then I learned that anywhere you go in LA, it seems in what I found from Google is that you have to do this pre-screening application. Some are longer, some are shorter, some, you know, never called me back or whatever, or never emailed me back. And so I I filled out like five or six of those while you're with me. And that was about as far as we got in the process. But even then I was glad that you were there because I was like, they're asking me all these hard hitting questions. Like, what am I going to do if she has, if the cat gets a catastrophic injury or like how much am I willing to spend of emergency fees? And what would I do if this happened? And they really, it's like, they're trying to give you a child or something. And it was funny because I was like, Oh, I, am the person that wants these rules to exist. But now, because I am the person who wants the automatic gratification of having a baby right now, I'm riling at the system. And ultimately, I I did my pre-application. A couple of those called me back. I did a... But then you have to do a video call with some of them and then you can go in person. I spent an hour at the shelter and then there was a certain point when I was there, I had my eye on a little lady and they were like, why don't you take Rosalie into the back room and Ooh. close the door? And I was like, what is this, the back room at a strip club? Like, <laughs> I just wanted one that had all four legs. Like, you know, I, I shouldn't even say that. Wow. They, did have a lot, they did have a lot of tripods. <laughs> Wow, that. but it's also hard to get one singular cat for one singular cat lady because they want all of them to go in pairs. They're already bonded, or they're you know old and in need of dependence. And I found the sweet spot—a little two-year-old perfect fur baby. Cat. I hate saying fur baby. I don't know why I'm saying it. I just I think I hate saying it, so I'm think, making myself think of it. But I also anyhow, I got a feline cat. I also just love that I like totally predicted the cat that you were gonna get. I was like, you should get like a one to two year old Russian blue. I was like, this is what I think you would like. And like aesthetically, your cat is like spot on for it. I was like, you will like a finicky independent cat. Like you don't want some cat that's just like, like, you know, whatever, just a slob, just doesn't even care anything. Like you need a clean lady who takes care of herself and keeps her space nice because that's who you are as well. You know? Yeah. You got it. You got the you perfect know, little And baby. I got the perfect cat. I, re- I gave her a new name. And, and what she, is her name? Her name's Lydia. She's already got a nickname, Lid the Squid, because she's a clumsy <laughs> little gal who just flops around and always lands upright somehow like a cat. I and love this. I love yeah, Lid the Squid. <laughs> and then, you know, I finally had a cat and uh, she, I think we finally bonded too now, which is great because she, she needed to assert her independence and be freaked out a little bit and she's you know she's not as cuddly as some cats but now but i that makes me appreciate it more when i get it 
I'm already whipped. I'm like, I'll do anything for this cat. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, you know, cats are the best. I'm, you know. So welcome to the pod family, Lydia. And thanks for helping us get there, Aunt Jackie. We've got Odin I, and Jupiter. They're cousins and they, I still haven't even met my, my, kitty niece like i haven't <laughs> i missed out on her so i'm gonna have to make a special trip well down there. when i think we have a, a future trip we we've talked about off pod where you're gonna come to lax so maybe you come visit me the day well, the yeah time come, come the well i can always come the day before hang out for a night meet the nice lady before we jet off to <laughs> cancun but <laughs> Exactly. All right, now we're just doing our, <laughs> our our housekeeping and our admin on pod pod time. It's off off the pod clock. Okay, this week we got quite the topic. That we do. Um, <laughs> you know, I think I, I think what we're going to talk about today is I'm going to have um what you would call a brain or a brain adjacent surgery. Um, it's not quite into my brain meat. I don't know what you're supposed to brain call it. Meat? I don't know. What do you call that? Brain stuff? mass? I don't brain know. mass. Brain mass. I kind of like brain meat, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Calling it a mass seems so unfriendly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's my brain meat and um, it's, it's really outside of that. So I, I I think that, you know, we've had my good friend Casey on who came on to talk about IVF. I think we have some people lined up in the future to talk about some other really like interesting, but also like vulnerable topics. And I kind of decided that, well, if uh, we're going to ask other people to be vulnerable, we should probably put ourselves in that same position. So, uh, yeah, a couple years ago, I found out that I had um, intracranial pressure. They originally thought I was going to have a brain tumor. Um, which thank God I did not have a brain tumor. That would have been less than fun. That was you and I didn't even know each other that long at that point. And uh, this is weeks before the pandemic. And uh, yeah, so I I, I found out that I was going to, I had this intracranial pressure and I needed to do something about it. I I don't know. I lived in denial for three years. Um, And how did you even find out something like that? Is that the kind of thing that you have to proactively seek out or it comes across only if you're lucky because some other thing is being treated or looked at? You know, it's actually one of those things that I had no idea was happening. Um, And so I went in for a routine eye exam and the guy's like looking in my eyes and he's like, what are you doing today? And I was like, well, I got to be at work in like 14 minutes. I got a call and you're making me late, buddy. (laughs) And, you know, I had health problems in my 20s. So I know anyone, anytime anyone says you need to go see another doctor today, they're very serious. And I was like, okay. And so I guess they could, I don't know what they can see, but they could see this like pressure in my eyes. And so that normally that's crazy. That's created by a brain tumor. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's how they found it. And then I, I was just like, okay, uh, what do you, I'm like, what's the, what's step one in receiving news like that? (laughs) Well, what's step one for Jackie or what's step one for a sane person? Yeah. A sane person, you know, hears that news, goes home, spends time with family, you know, processes it. I went directly to work. (laughs) (laughs) I believe on my way there, I called my boss and was like, hey, I found this out. I might have a brain tumor um, because at that point I didn't know. And I was like, I don't want to talk about it. I'm going to come into work. And so I'm just going to do that. And they were like, is that a good idea? And I was like, probably not. Um, And then, you know, it took you, but you didn't just ignore it. I guess you have to. Well, so first I had to find out if it was a brain tumor. Yeah, I first had to find out. And so then it it wasn't a brain tumor. And I was like, okay, well, then, you know, what's going on? And um, it's essentially there's pressure. The theory is that there's too much fluid around my brain. It's called a pseudo brain tumor around my brain. So, of course, I'm faking it. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Just needed one more thing, didn't you? 
I didn't have enough. I just like to. Well, you didn't know the pandemic was coming. You wouldn't have scheduled both. How do you know? But it was kind of too late. So you're like, I did schedule the pandemic. Go totally right there. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, February to March. Oops, got the bingo cards mixed up again. Um. Yeah. So no, I, I, so I first found out I didn't have that. And then I basically was just kind of like, okay, they were saying, oh, you might be born this way, or it's possible that, you know, what we think is happening is happening. So then I met with a neurologist and then I met with an ophthalmologist. And now I meet with a neuro ophthalmologist, which if you didn't know one of those exists, you do now. Um, Those guys got to have nice boats. They just... I'm really glad you went with boat. (laughs) (laughs) That you're going to say butts. And I was like, why? (laughs) Uh, I'm just thinking no one's, you know, they've got like a good high skilled job, but it ain't too dirty. You know, they just get in and get out once. And I got to say, my doctor is phenomenal and I, I'm a big fan of him. Um, But yeah, so I. So essentially I found that out. And then at that point, it's just like, yeah, we wait and we watch because we're trying to see, is it progressing because you have this thing that we, you have this intracranial pressure, it's called IHH. Um, Or were you born this way and your like ocular cavity just looks kind of funny, right? So I'm obviously a doctor, um, but it's essentially the pressure putting on it. And so if you're like looking at the eye like this way, there's like a nerve that's like being pushed forward that you can actually see in the scans. It's really interesting until you know what's happening and then it's horrifying. But uh, your optic nerve, your optic your o- nerve, your ocular motor. Oh, I know all the facial nerves, oh, craniofacial. You yes, you better know those <laughs> nerves, sister. Why? We don't know. <laughs> no one knows. Um and so I, I just waited for a long time. And then six weeks later, six weeks later, the pandemic started. And I was like, you know what seems not so important? Watching this thing. And so I, of course, you know, went in for my routine <laughs> doctor appointments. But it just was kind of like filed to the back of my brain. as like, future Jackie will deal with this. Uh, so that's... Uh... And this is... But you are feeling it, too, though. Like, physically... I did it giving for a you long headaches? Time. Like, oh, so I am broken seven ways from Sunday, so I already have migraines and a lot of things like... that cause headaches. So I do think the last year I've started to feel it. Like, I, you know, we, I talked about how I went to Peru when I was in Peru. I had really bad altitude sickness, um, and I've been getting altitude sickness more and more, uh, worse and worse the last few years. And I'm like, maybe that's because there's too much pressure with all this fluid going on. And Up so there. at this point, are they giving you options for options based on what happens based on their findings? Yeah. So like once we like could tell that it was definitely getting worse, then it became like, how do we treat it? And so I have some other illnesses. I have something called postular orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Um, called, it's called POTS for short, as well as migraines with aura. I have celiac. I have quite a few. I have autonomic reflex system disorders. I have uh, autoimmune disorders. So they gave me, started trying different medications. Well, two of the medications I've already had really bad adverse reactions to. Um, And then they tried the last one and it flared up my POTS. And so anyone out there who has, you know, a combination of illnesses knows how hard it is to treat one if they have like kind of like opposite symptoms, right? Like we're like this pills that they were trying to do me was a diuretic. So it was trying to dehydrate me. Whereas my POTS is flared up incredibly by being dehydrated. So <laughs> it's, it's one of those things that just becomes really, really hard when you are out there with multiple illnesses. Cause it's, you know, I think a lot of medicine is set up for people to be oh, you have heart disease, you take this pill and then you feel better, right? But there's a lot of people out there, especially with invisible illnesses, you know, ones that that don't show, um, have really hard experiences and, you know, people don't take you seriously because you can't really accurately ex- describe what's happening because it's like, oh yeah, one day this is wrong and another day this is wrong and the next day <laughs> it's a third thing. So, um, yeah. 
so how do you even, I mean, wow, I'm just thinking too about the time away from work and figuring things out with your insurance and just the like sheer scheduling of it all and all of that butting up against your life with a nice little lockdown just for fun. I, well, I will say I've been very fortunate to have, um, workplaces that were very supportive of taking care of me and me taking care of myself. I did not have that luxury in the past. Uh, when I was sick in my twenties, I had a workplace that really just treated me poorly. Hi, Lydia. Uh, (laughs) uh, I had a workplace that treated me really poorly when I got sick and, um, frankly, some practices that might've been illegal back then, definitely illegal now. Um, but I've been fortunate to the scheduling piece and to have insurance, right? Like, like talk about, you know, terrifying is not having insurance, not knowing how you're going to pay for something um, when you need it. And do you think that's part of why you immediately dove back into work is feeling like you need to be sure that you, or is that just more of a distraction tactic? So you have something to keep your mind on. I mean, I don't know if I was ready for that question, but like, yeah, like I think both. And I think, also, like, for me, work is something that I've always really felt like I was good at. Like, I've almost always been really, really successful at every job I've ever done. And I think for me, when something doesn't make sense, I revert to a place that does. And, you know, I had a chaotic childhood at, at, for a lot of it. And, you know, different points in my adulthood were chaotic. And so I think my personal life is not always the place where I run to for like (laughs) to feel better because work just makes sense to me. I get work. It's easy for me. I enjoy doing it. And so, yeah, I think it's a lot of coping skills. Is that healthy? Absolutely (laughs) not. I absolutely try not to do that now. I have a tendency to still do it. Um, Well, another part of the health suite is the mental health suite. So I know that's something that's just as important to go along with physical treatment is our lovely mental health practitioners. Yeah. And then, like, you know, we are severely lacking enough mental health practitioners in this country. I mean, if you talk about just basic trauma that Americans are going through right now, we live in a world of instability and violence and, you know, indecision and yeah, whole other podcasts. But <laughs> So I think, you know, to, to kind of where that journey changed from going from medication was they weren't working. And then a few months ago, I just, I realized I couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't go in every couple months and wait for it to continue to get worse. Cause what will eventually happen is that if I, this went untreated and I did nothing, I would eventually go blind. It would, I would lose my sight and I paint, I read, Um, that would be, I think out of like losing something that would be really, really hard for me to cope with. And that would be irreversible at that point. You know, honestly, I've never asked. I have some friends who have a web MD in this subject now. Um, (laughs) but you know, I think I don't even having to deal with that at all is so scary because you don't know when it could, I mean, maybe you would get some kind of warning, but sounds like the kind of thing that might just happen. Oh yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've like woken up and been 100% sure it was the day. (sighs) Like I'm like, I'm going, this is the day I'm like losing it. I'm going blind. Um, But yeah, I I mean, again, like I I think comparatively, if I had a, if I had actually had a brain tumor, like I, I got lucky, right? Like I, this could be so much worse. I think as we kind of go into the maybe lighter subject of part of this is what I, the, the surgery is actually going to be like and what I know versus <laughs> what I didn't know, because I, I am very lucky. Uh, modern medicine, I, I mean, OK, first off, it's a day healing um, and they're going out around and messing around with the veins in my brain. So that's mind I mean back in the day they just called you a witch yeah threw you in the yeah <laughs> the I would have gone blind right <laughs> or like or I would have been a witch or they would have cracked my head open and you know what have been you know, you know what would be helpful for this ice pick lobotomy yeah so sweet <laughs> so well, that brings you to now when you you can take action and you're 
getting leading up to this surgery, they're going to go in, put some modern technology in you. I got a question for you, Bex. Uh -huh. Okay. So they're operating on the veins of basically where my neck and my head meet area, like at the bottom of your brain, right? They're operating on the, the veins there. Where do you think they go in? <laughs> your neck. <laughs> I was trying to think of like what what <laughs> veins are around there. I'm like, um, plot twist. Apparently, it's the groin, which that's not in your neck. <laughs> it's not even near your neck, Bex. It's, and I was like, mine is not close to my neck at all. I was like, sir, I don't. Are you sure you're a doctor? <laughs> like, I don't. Well, and then it realized, Bex, like, I'm going to, you know, have to get everything cleaned up down there to have brain surgery. And that's some bullshit right there. Only you would have to get waxed for brain surgery, Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> well, who knows? Like, I don't, how many people are going to be in this room? Okay? Because I, like. Well, typically, you don't have to clean up your bush for a brain surgery. Yeah, but, like, what if, uh, yeah, so people might see my vagine. To get brain surgery, which is incredibly traumatizing to think about. Um, is your doctor cute? Okay, so I might have done a deep dive. I might have done. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> I might have spent six hours looking up my doctor. So I did find his fellowship graduation photo from 2017. I guess looking up your doctor would be a big part of knowing you're getting surgery. Okay, wait, gra wait, his picture from when? His graduation from his fellowship in 2017. <laughs> that is not the year that I wanted it to be. It wasn't the year that I wanted it to be, but he's also <laughs> not bad looking. So I was like, I don't know if that's better or worse. Like, I, uh, oh God. Like, I don't know. And then maybe he gets in there and he's like, oh, whoa, there's too much. We can't help this. <laughs> like, turn around, turn it around. Turn it around. Um, oh, no. They're going in through the back. No, that's worse. <laughs> so, um, okay. And then I also found a podcast that he had been on as well. So shout out to his podcast. Maybe he can be on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and he's in part three, what Jackie's machine looked like. Wow. Wow. Okay. So... That seems like a far way to go. I mean, are they going to just sedate you head to toe? Like No. Okay, Bex, I got to be awake. I got to be awake for it. Which... <laughs> How can you be awake? That doesn't even make sense. It didn't make sense to me they either. They can't open you up. Well, I guess, how much are they opening you? I'm so confused. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to exaggerate here. I literally blacked out when he said I was awake and he like got like three or four sentences like in <sighs> and I literally had to stop and then be like, I'm sorry. I I just blacked out, blacked out for a second. Did, <laughs> did you say that I needed to be awake? And he was like, "Yes." And then I just started crying hysterically. And he's like, "I'm sorry. I'm sorry." And I was like, "Oh dear Lord, are you?" And they no drugs, not a single drug. But how no drugs? I guess you don't even feel it. I guess they give me local drugs where they cut into my grind. Okay. And then they send a little a local anesthesia up my veins like that. Wacky inflatable tube man style <laughs> all the way up to the top. <laughs> and then just blowgun dart some little metal <laughs> sheets in there and close her up, boys. You did not that. need that visual of the blow dart. <laughs> He just goes down, blows on my grind where the hole is. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm a doctor. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> and that's what we think surgery's like, right? <laughs> yeah. And then he's like, nurse. And then she's like, and then it's great. <laughs> she gives me a little kiss, too. <laughs> no band aid, no suture, just a little. Nope. And just then you're all good. Kiss. They said, okay, so the first one, they make sure that I need the surgery. There's two surgeries. Oh, Sorry, I left that. You said the first one. <laughs> <laughs> There's two surgeries. So this one, they're just like, 
you know, coming around, seeing what's going on, checking the flooring, that kind of stuff. Oh, this is a reconnaissance mission. It it is a reconnaissance (laughs) mission. And then I guess for the second one, the little wavy, wacky, inflatable tube man is larger. Size does matter. And I get to be Uh, asleep for that. She's a size queen down to the veins. (laughs) No, I'm so uncomfortable with all of this. Jackie. So I'm going to have brain surgery, and I just thought... And you're going to be the expert on brain surgery. I'm definitely going to be the expert on brain surgery. I have one. <laughs> brain surgery adjacent through my groin. I'm just glad they don't have to shave my head. Like, if they had to shave True. my head, like, I would be really upset. I have shaved my head. I loved it. Every day I wish I could shave my head again. But Would you shave really your head out of solidarity? Uh, yeah. Okay. 100%. Basically okay. because I'm looking for any excuse. Okay. I'm actually, I'm kind of now looking forward to our bald journey together. <laughs> my head is really lumpy though. I can tell from just feeling it. So imagine how lumpy it's going to look. <laughs> You're like that hole never closed. You know, that hole the babies have. <laughs> I, you just got to make sure you do your eyebrows or not, you know, do whatever you want to do. But I felt like having eyebrows really, otherwise you're just like a thumb. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I have never thought about that. You got to do your eyebrows. Do a little eyebrow, a little lip color. Now I don't wear any makeup because, hey, long hair privilege. Oh my God. Okay. Any, any other questions on the fact that I'm going to get waxed? untaxed and ice not ready to relax (laughs) ice pick max i kind of like ice no like you know ice pick axe it was too many it didn't scan it's too many (laughs) syllables it's fine we don't have to go back for it um are there such a one day recovery that seems crazy i think you should milk it for at least 17 months i do I do plan taking off more than a day because like, I'm like, physically I can recover. Emotionally, it's going to take me a minute. <laughs> like he yeah, did and- say he did. His words were once, and this is the first surgery. Once we get the measurements, I will flush you with drugs. And I was like, it's <laughs> my boy right there. <laughs> once we get the codes, we're going to flush you with drugs. This is what she always wanted to hear. <laughs> Okay, good. And then you'll keep, you'll get a hefty prescription following. And are these back to back? The one two punch? No, I wish I'm gonna have to. Well, if I even qualify for the second surgery, if I qualify for the second surgery, we'll do a part two. If I don't, I'm gonna be crying for three more months. So it's gonna take a minute. Why three more months? Do they do something else? No, it's just going to take me that long to emotionally handle it. Oh, okay. but Oh, yeah, yeah, what? because they'll do something else. And I've heard that it's the old way. And all they're trying to do is they're trying, they just have identified the arteries that need to be expanded and they're going, that's the mission. That's the objective is to expand them either by the first way that they want to do the new way or there's another way to do it. So, like, imagine if you had, like, okay, your veins were... So you have veins that basically are coming down the back of your head and they kind of like go like this, right? And they they come from one and they, they kind of like dovetail two, around. And then they go back and down into your like neck and your back and all of that stuff, right? Yeah. So that's your like spinal fluid that should be draining into the rest of your body. Now the theory is, is that my spinal fluid is not because my veins are too small. Those veins that dovetail, right? So imagine what they're going to do is like if you have like a little straw, right, they're going to make a little titanium straw and then they're going to put that where my vein is too thin so that my vein grows around the titanium straw and is thicker by itself. Wow. Science. Isn't that wild? One day, one day is all it's going to take for me to heal from you literally putting a titanium straw under my head. I and just, they just stay there? They don't ever move? Well, or so have here's to be replaced. the thing. They've only been doing these for like 10 to 15 years. 
So theoretically, it should never have to be replaced. But we're still in the TBD phase. <laughs> You're part of that theory, Jackie. <laughs> I'm going to tell you again, literally the old option is like (laughs) crack it into your skull and changing it manually. So I, I'll take this version. They like, they are still, it would still be the same idea of inserting tubes, but they would just go in a different way. No, They would go like, I'm pretty sure. And like, remember I'm squeamish. I can only handle so much knowledge on like these subjects without vomiting. But I'm pretty sure they, like, go in and they, like, surgically, like, cutting and, like, moving things make your veins bigger. I see. Versus, like, this is just putting a little straw in there. And then, like, the thought is that it, the, it, it the vein the grows right around support. it. You know what this means. Right? <laughs> mm, <boy. laughs> you sort of egg beater hands in the air. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Uh, so they do this and then you do this and then everything goes through Uh, why did we start doing video sounds perfect well (laughs) i have a lot of questions for future jackie who we should try to get her while she's on drugs (laughs) she Get her drunk, she'll say anything. I'll uh, put myself in the will. <laughs> okay. So one story before we go. You're already in the will. Uh, one story before oh, we go. <laughs> surprise. <laughs> so the last big surgery I had, I'm coming home from the surgery and I am asking my mom, like, do I need to go back in and get stitches out? Because they had cut into me. And she was like, No. And I was like, oh, are they biodegradable stitches? And she was like, no. And again, my mom knows how squeamish I am. (laughs) And I was like, well, what did they do? Like how, like, I just have an open wound. Like, and she was like, they cauterized it. (gasps) Oh my God. (laughs) I was like, they burned me. And she was like, I was hoping you didn't know what that meant. (laughs) Mom. UC Davis like okay I went to a really really good school I know at least what cauterize meant wow well let's hope they don't have to do that this time no because they're going in through the groin Bex sure and I'm gonna be awake (laughs) (laughs) well it sounds like you are about to be an expert on brain surgery. I wish I wasn't, yeah. (laughs) The reluctant expert. (laughs) Hi, everyone. Welcome back from the break. We're here for part two, getting even deeper into the trenches. You ready for this, Jackie? (laughs) I don't know how if I like how you put that getting even deeper into the trenches. (laughs) that's a that's a wild ride Bex I know it's like the the trenches of the brain folds all right you've already you've already gone too far no it's not it's that was that was offensive I see (sighs) all right I guess I guess that was that was actually less of a anxious response than I had to the initial going into the surgery i was gonna try and say it like funny and french and (laughs) hip and cool and i did not make it happen it's already Um, strange enough it doesn't need uh translations and metaphors well talking about strange all right uh i think i think the best part to start with is really where i started to panic spiral which is where most of my best stories truly began which is the day before (laughs) They call you up and they're like, here's all your prep stuff. Here's everything you need to know. BT dubs. Make sure you bring your last will and testament. And I was, I was like, what? I'm sorry. I thought this was Mm -hmm. like a simple little thing. And then I don't carry yours everywhere. You don't have a a pocket version. I mean, I do have one and I have shared it with the important people, but I'm going to be real. I hadn't updated it in a while. And I was like, okay, like, you know, I guess I have to pick my niece up from swimming practice tonight. So I'm like sitting in my car, panic spiraling, leaving messages to my dead loved ones on my phone, just like a straight up Mm -hmm. video of 
this is what I think. And you know what? I love you. I don't even know what I said. One of these days, if I really am feeling like I want to be a really sad sack, then I'll just watch those videos. I'm up <laughs> oh, on TV. no. Uh, but that, that's that, like, have you ever had you a know, surgery? That's, that's just, you know, reopening wounds of a hype, something hypothetical. You know, that's just a sucker fest for no point. I do love a sucker fest. Um, all right. Have you have you ever had surgery, Bex? I have had surgery. I've had the traditional, um, when I was born, they cut my umbilical cord. I consider that surgery. Okay. I had was uh, my wisdom teeth removed. Out, removed. So that's that's okay. going to count again. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. I uh, had, and then I had a broken bone surgery in twenty. Gosh, I got to remember 2016. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Which we'll touch back on a another episode that <laughs> on a future in episode. The future. Yeah. <laughs> But, but actually, I did we'll have in the future, but it'll be for this episode. So it'll be a really <laughs> weird uh, time and phrase for our brains. But I did have the, oh gosh, the, the phlebotomist was a very, 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 very old man. And okay. that, that was a double whammy because uh, sort of sociopolitically, he asked me if the driver that hit me was a woman. So that was fun way to start. And then when he was doing my, like going to give me the, I get the, what is it? Like painkiller stuff. I'm like, not, that's not the word Mm -hmm. sedative. (laughs) He was just like shaking. He was like, now if I miss this vein by a 14th of a millimeter, I could paralyze you forever. And I was like, can we get the intern in here? He looks like his hands are steady. Like let's, but he just like put it in the right vein. And then the, the nice young internist took over and I was, I had a bit of a life flash before my eyes moment. Wow. That's a vibe. I, on many occasions have gotten the intern who did miss the vein like six times, including this time at the hospital. Um, But uh, someone shaky would definitely make me (laughs) be a little nervous when you're, when you're going for precision there. Um, but so, okay. So if you're having surgery, they kind of bring you in, they prep you, like you either take off all your clothes or whatever clothes you need to, you get a sweet gown, butt out in the back. Sometimes you get to cover it. Sometimes you don't. (laughs) And then they like, you know, they give you an IV if you're getting an IV, which for me this time, the first person was not extremely accurate. And, uh, you kind of like, usually at this point, they kind of like start to prep you for the surgery. I'm used to then being drugged, which honestly, <laughs> 10 out of 10, my favorite part of surgeries, right? Like I like to be flying high as a kite when they talk to me about any medical stuff because I do not want to know it. So um, <laughs> this is actually great insight because my surgery, I didn't have to take any clothes off because it was my arm. So I wouldn't even have con- like thought about when that step came, came, like would come in. And I don't remember feeling medicated. I just was like, boink, boink, surgery over. <laughs> well, I had a lot of colonoscopies. So, you know, <laughs> it's definitely butt out for those. <laughs> Um, I think they make you take your top off too. I think it's but just again, for fun, you know, like make it fun. <laughs> I don't, luckily I don't remember those and I'm glad that I do not. Um, but yeah, so this, this time I did not get medicated. So instead I got wheeled into the ER, like, or I guess the OR, the operating Raw. room, like wide awake, oh. just raw dogging surgery if you will a sight no civilian should have to see no no and i'm just looking up and it's like it's like the nightmares where you wake up during surgery that was literally what was happening and i they plop me over to this table and i'm no jokes bex they strap me in they strap this they strap this this delicate little flower of a lady to the table how many and, straps um, are we talking? At least legs, three. chest. 
three legs, chest, times. and head. 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 That's disgusting that your head well, had to be strapped in. And then they put me in it's this like... like tube thing, so I couldn't move my arms. Like all I could do was like really oh my move my God. hands. <laughs> and You're I like in a, like, a sleeping bag, or I don't know, kind like of, uh, yeah, like being well, institutionalized started... or something. They started covering me with blankets, and I'm sure I covered this in in part one, but this surgery, they go in through the groin, which meant that the only part that was not covered was my vagina and the (laughs) corresponding areas. And let me tell you, your girl cleaned up. Oh, yeah. And your girl cleaned up because I didn't know if they would have if they needed it cleaned up, but I figured if anyone was going to be going down there, I should do them that favor. And yeah, no the joke, last thing this... you need to add to your surgical wounds is razor burn. They've got to do a quick job in the OR. Nope. Mm-mm. Well, and no joke, this nurse nurse or whoever came up to me and was like, so we're going to have to shave you. And I was like, well, I, I, you know, I cleaned up downstairs and she was like, okay, well, I'll have to check. And she pulls out this shaver and it's like, Burr. and she's like, this is what we No, use. No, that's horrifying. What is she trying to do? Scare you straight from having brain surgery? Like, you better not lie to me here. I'm going to have to clip your... Shave clip, you. Clip. Literally <laughs> shave you. <laughs> and so she took a peek at my vagine and she said, good job. And I really what I needed that day <laughs> wow if I wish I could start every day like that mm-hmm. I you know what actually I do not love that a stranger totally looked at my <laughs> vagine and I'm gonna be real I thought it was over at this point I really really thought that like the really humiliation part of it was over because they I knew that they were gonna put this thing over me that's like kind of like a radiation thing that they you when you get x-rays and it had yeah. like two holes cut out like on either side of like your groin basically like where your hip is right and so i was like oh great my vagina is gonna get covered up soon and then she looks at me and she's like we're gonna have to sanitize the area and let me tell you bex i didn't sanitize the area when i shaved okay because i didn't know sanitizing the area was a thing that you have to do so you know those like that sounds like it's sponge- gonna be the worst cut version of aftershave. It's worse. It just it's, burn. It's, not, it's not feeling, but you know those little like sponges on a stick that you can like clean your dishes with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it was like two of those. <laughs> no. <laughs> and she dipped it in some iodine, and then she just went to town for two whole minutes, and she oh, is just gosh. And you know what the best part is, Bex? Multiple people walked into the OR while my vagina is getting fully rubbed by a woman. I don't know. Um, They're like, oh, we're doing a a beaver wipe down. (laughs) Aisle three. (laughs) Aisle three beaver wipe down. Let me get a look. Let me get a glance at this. Hey, interns, why don't you come in here and take a look at this proper wipe down technique? (laughs) It's it's what we call a slip and slide, actually. (laughs) Oh, no. Uh, I mean, I thought apparently the pandemic taught us that we weren't washing our hands long enough. It turns out we're also not washing our vagines long enough. It's, I guess, anything. So if you really want to clean, you're going to have to get two sponges <laughs> on a stick and just go just to town. A nice brown sheen on you. And as I realized, you know, I this the one was like brownish red. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. all over um and at this moment i realized it was most definitely the most humiliating moment of my life um but it's good I guess to be I aware when that's more. happening though 100 uh, percent aware i knew i saw that i saw that um so we've now finished with that we've covered me up the surgeon comes in he flips on some maroon five <laughs> which i was like oh, what a five what a vibe. You know, I'm glad that you like a little soft rock when you mm-hmm. cut into people. So, well, Maybe he's they, like uh, picturing how much he hates Adam Levine and he's like, I'm going to cut you. Oh, that's terrible. I don't want to spread violence towards Mr. Levine. He's fine. And I love Adam Levine. Like, I don't know. I, okay, I don't follow pop culture. So if he's turned into an asshole in the last five years, 
I apologize. But last I heard, he has. He, nice he has, Jackie. You missed the Adam Levine scandal, as usual. Really? <laughs> That's upsetting. Yeah. Was it recent? But just like a stand, just a standard one, just an infidelity one. That's really, you know, chump change these days for as far as scandals Comparatively, go. yeah, it's not as bad. Not as bad. <laughs> well, <laughs> as we're listening to Maroon 5, they did give me some light topical lidocaine in the in the spot where they were doing the oh, thing and God. i don't ex- exactly know what they did but i do know that they catheterized my artery um which to my understanding is putting a tube in my tube like vein it's already a tube man that's a tube on a tube it's tubes and tubes and tubes it's tubeception of my artery it's tube city oh tubeception tubeception um, so, okay, at this point, I can't feel it a lot, but what I do feel is like something's like banging around in like my hips. It's like a, a pipe and like a hollow. No. Yeah. And I was like, that's odd feeling. And then they're going up, they're going up, they're going up. And all of a sudden I just hear this like pop and I can tell that's the noise of him getting into my brain, which is just the weirdest sensation because also, You've why did there have the to be a pop? I don't know. Well, it gets worse. The noises get worse. Because at this point, he's like, BT dubs, you might hallucinate. And I was like, could hallucinate? Because I do. He's like, are you like real, officer? See- <laughs> and yeah, so some lights started happening. And then he's like poking around in my brain, trying to find the right spot. And I'm not, this was the weirdest experience. It sounded like static, but like the static was screaming. And that was like the sound of him poking, casual screaming static of him poking around inside the brain. And then he did the other side. It's like a nail on the chalkboard, but it's inside your head. Yeah, it was the weirdest sound. It also kind of sounds like, you know, when you're blowing your nose and it makes that screechy noise? Kind of like that, too. Okay, maybe that's just can't say that's ever happened to me, Jackie, but you did need surgery, so maybe (laughs) something else is going on there. You know when the aliens come get you and you just start tripping balls? That's... no. Um... (laughs) At that point, I think, oh, this was what was really wild. It was I, you know, we're measuring at this point because this first part is more of, I believe it's more of a procedure than necessarily a surgery. The second part where they put the stent in is where they actually do the surgical piece. Um, So this part, they're measuring it, right? And I can hear him say like four, four, five, seven, seven. 29 (laughs) i just got really really high and i was like i feel like those are the numbers that prove that what we think is happening is happening um oh but you're like awake for all of this it's so yeah i can hear it we're talking while he's messing you know what's even wilder is because in my peripheral i can see the tv that he's looking at oh of, of my brain where he's poking around like it has I, a camera on it? No, because there's an X-ray of my brain happening while he's poking around, so he can see where he's going. So I can see in my head while he's inside my head, and I could hear the noises inside my head. I don't like that. Yeah, I'm gonna be real, Bex. You know, I've not had like I've had some real shit happen in my life. This is by far the most traumatic thing I've ever been through. By far, I was like, this is not cool i will give my surgeon some like major props because i think he great bedside manner he really did like a good job at being like you're okay everything is fine everything is good you know we're getting what we want there was definitely a part where i started crying like a lot because i was scared and i was stressed and the nurse was really fantastic just saying like hey it's okay i know you're scared you just need to get through this like you just need to like you know, we're getting the answers that you want. And I will say that, like, I felt like my experience in that sense was really, really positive. I know not everyone has, like, positive surgery experiences. So I do like to kind of point out when that staff was really great. Like, 
my my surgeon's bedside manner was fantastic. Like he was a really nice guy, really, really kind, really gave me all the advice I needed and everything. I told him I didn't want to know what was happening. He didn't tell me much. It was great. Um, and then when we finished, oh, I wanted I'll, to know everything that's happening. <laughs> I'll set up a, pre, a, a consult with you and my surgeon. Be like you, Reagan <laughs> and Casey can all can all kind of get all that details that you guys love and I don't want. <laughs> Um, but when it was over, they, you know, they were taking me out of the ER. I'm so relieved it's over. And all I wanted to know was, I, am I a good candidate for the stent? That's all I wanted to know. Because if I had to go through that um, and not get an answer, it would have been really hard. And I think one of the things, like, through my life that's been really, really hard is I've had medical problems my entire life. And I really, really struggled to get diagnoses growing up. And it what it's so traumatizing to be in pain or to be sick and to know something's wrong with you and to hear from medical professionals, no, everything's fine. The test showed up okay. Um, so I like, you know, I think if I had gotten another we don't know, um, we didn't get the answer, it's not showing it. I I don't know if I would have been able to handle that. So like I'm getting out of that surgery and I'm like, am I a good candidate? Just tell me now. Like I want to know. And I was so fortunate because I did get that answer. I did get that I'm a good candidate for the stent. And so I am going to go forward with the second part. And as my brother said, he's like, oh, they managed you so well. Because at the beginning of this, I was like, I have to do this. This is so crazy. I don't want it. And now I'm like, oh, thank God I'm a good candidate for the Please stent. Please tell me I can do it. Please tell me. I can. Yeah. <laughs> Right. They're like, not only are you a candidate, you are an Olympic level candidate. And that is yes. very bad news for you, but that is good news for the surgery. <laughs> yeah. And I think I'm sure that there's a lot of people out there who have gone through that, like that not getting a diagnosis. And I've spent, you know, weeks in hospitals trying to get answers, flown all over the country to try and get answers. It's traumatizing. Anyone who's experienced that, it's awful. It's so awful, which is why like I'm talking about this experience, even though it's not in detail something that I normally talk about, but I think it's it's really important to like to try and get those answers and be you know your own advocate for your health and try and figure it out because if you don't have it, it it sucks. So yeah, I've heard that you can, and this is you know maybe something earlier on in a process or maybe not quite related to this specific procedure for you, but in, as far as people just not being believed by their healthcare providers about their their symptoms or whatever they're trying to get more information on, that your medical chart is yours and that yep. you can always ask to see it and that you could always ask that if they're refusing to take any further steps for treatment, that they document that so that you begin yep. like a paper trail of these are the symptoms I, the patient presented and my doctor is, you know, declining any further you know, looking into it any yeah. further and that like, that's, you know, sometimes, uh, unfortunately the path you'll have to take, which is so, it's so unfortunate. And I mean, I'm sure there are like logical reasons too. Like, I'm not saying that there's a fleet of malicious healthcare providers out there. It's just, it's so hard to be one person up against the system. No, you're, you're hitting so many points. Yeah. Like one, you're your own advocate. You fight for yourself. You know, if you can't identify somebody in your life that can, right? Like you're the only person who's going to get it. You can always get a second opinion. It might cost you money. You might have to go outside your network or whatever that be, but your health is number one and find those answers. And then, yeah, like there are medical professionals that really care. They're wrong. Sometimes they don't have all the knowledge, right? Like sometimes a new treatment just came out and you need to see a specialist, right? Sometimes they've seen a lot of patients, their patient population leans one way, right? Like they may only see male, you know, born male identifying, right? And maybe you're a trans person and they don't know how to deal with that. That is, you know, an unfortunate area of the system that needs to be improved, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't get the help that you need. That means you're still your own advocate. There are people out there and you're totally right, Bex, 100%. And, you know, that textbook that doctors are always, they have to read the newest one that comes out every year and, 
and you know do their own due diligence to keep abreast of trends in medicine all those things come from doing it wrong the last textbook had what they thought was the current up-to-date information and then they did it wrong and then that was an individual you know that had a botched treatment or ineffectual care routine you know and then they make the new textbook based on like real human data you know it's a a constantly evolving science it's really it can be so slow sometimes and that's a yeah and that's amazing that there is this new procedure that isn't like you you know you're not going to have to resort to stone age brain surgery you're getting the shiny new stuff well and that's so true the the other options of this would have been much worse and and how lucky am i to live in a day and age where this is an option and hopefully a hundred years from now, there's an even better option. And yeah, I think we continue to, to kind of go on and, and grow and we could probably go on for this for a long while, but maybe we leave that for the end of part three. <laughs> Let's find out what happens to me in part three. Hi, everyone. Welcome to part three of... Jackie as our expert this episode. A lot has happened. I I can't even tell you. I'm not quite, I didn't listen to part two before we did this. So I don't even remember the things we were speculating. I know there was a lot on your mind to think through. And now Jackie, welcome back from the other side of surgery. Yeah, I mean, I'm fully a bionic woman now. Um, I respect, you know, I, it's it's now that if I'm not making sense that you can just unplug me for 10 seconds and plug me right back in. Uh, just no, have a few me. magnets around you. It could be a reboot. That's making, <laughs> that's me making light of trauma. Uh, so yeah, I think I, I actually didn't listen to part two either. So I have no idea what I said, um, but I'm sure it was really insightful and meaningful to a lot mm-hmm. of people out there. Made a difference. Um, Well, I think what's today? Today I am not even a full week out, Um, but as you can see, I'm here. I'm fine. I think one of the interesting things as like an adult going through this is my niece asking if I was going to be the same person, right? Because like their understanding of the brain and um, I probably mentioned this after the first one, but she goes like, are you okay? And then seeing her the other night, she was again like, big eyes like is that still my aunt um no it's still me (laughs) aunt jackie's been replaced by a psyop i mean that happened a long time ago but she wasn't even born yet so that's fine (laughs) that's the one that's the version of you she knows the best yeah yeah so this um this surgery though was i would you know jump right into it i would say it would a completely different experience. Like I think this time I, they, I was given all of the good drugs. Mm-hmm. Um, they were like, you go night, night. And I was like, that sounds great. Um, and I think I'd be lying if I said that I had no nerves going into it and that like, I was just ready for this. And I mean, a part of me was ready for it, but I was definitely really scared. Um, you know, my surgeon came in in the morning and he was like, Oh, like, you still seem really nervous. He's like, we've really talked everything through. Like, you know, you're good. And I'm like, yeah, like, I'm just, I'm still nervous. And he's like, oh, are you, are you nervous of dying? And I honestly was like, no, wow. like, that's actually like not my fear. Well, and I think because he was asking because he knows that the surgery isn't high risk for death. Right. And, and, and I believe that. Right. Um, and so I think that in that moment, though, my fear was in a completely different place that, what if I go through all of this? What if I have this surgery? What if I've been through all this trauma and stress and, and I don't feel better and nothing changes and it just feels like for nothing. And I think that would be, that was my big fear. Um, so (laughs) I think that was like going into it, the, the kind of first thing. And then, you know, obviously this time I got to go right to sleep this time when they, sanitized me um <laughs> the area the area i mean i see one i <laughs> area 35 okay <laughs> oh, okay you're right you're right you're right sorry um under this, the hill yeah thank you uh this time i definitely was like asleep i saw the remnants of it but i was like okay i didn't have to lay there 
and experience that humiliation. Um, oh, is there like time. a big band-aid, bandaid on your inner thigh when you came out? Yeah, it's like it was like saran wrapped almost what it seems like. It's like a sticky saran wrap and they placed it all over the area, oh. uh, which I had last time because um, actually mm -hmm. so the first time when they were doing the testing, the angiogram, they were testing each side to see how you know narrow my veins were. So they went in both sides and one side they went in artery and one side they went in a vein. The mm. artery was why I got that little balloon thing to close it up. <clears throat> So this time they only did one side. They only did my right side um, and they only went in through a vein. So actually my wound was much smaller this time, which I appreciated. Um, and then, I, you know, I think, yeah, like I went into surgery and, and I came out and um, yeah, like I, you know, I had to stay in the ICU. So I knew that I had to be in there for that long. And I essentially slept the majority of the time that I was there, um, I listened to some podcasts. Uh, I had, <laughs> I really was ambitious. Like, I, so after the first surgery, my head totally felt fine. Like I didn't feel really anything up there, but my wounds were much bigger. And that was like the bigger stress and concern. Whereas this surgery of my head and still, still it, it really hurts. Like it's, it's not like a sharp, painful type of thing, but it's like, it's, there's something in my brain expanding an area that that was much much smaller before um wow. so i can like feel that and it's like blood rushes to my head it's painful or when I, we were just recording another uh episode earlier and <laughs> every time i laughed my head hurts so i'm like i'm glad we can have a solemn episode this time <laughs> and i can laugh less mm -hmm. but yes. it, it's kind of like that different thing so i've been a lot more tired a lot more just like ready to um I don't know, take a, take a nap at any moment. Um, than I was. The so, first time. so this is, so this is a, a veins issue. Yeah. So and I don't know. I, I will I don't fully know the difference between veins and arteries. And I Good actually question. was like, I actually don't know which one's bigger. I'm assuming arteries. Correct. So a okay. vein is like, if you want to use it, like a vein, you could think about is like your fingers. They're like that size, right? Like, and if this finger doesn't work, you got other fingers and it's fine, right? An artery is like your arm, right? It's the big, it's your biggest vein. Mm -hmm. And that's why you're such high risk to bleed out. Like, that's why if like someone gets cut in the neck by kind of where their grinds are or mm -hmm. right in here, you bleed out so quickly because that's an artery. Um, and you can't just put pressure on something to make an artery stop bleeding. Um, you have to like cauterize uh, it or like take them to the hospital. Like something more has to be done. A vein will, you'll get a big enough clot and that'll stop bleeding. So arteries are much larger. And so to explain it at the back of your head and I'll put pictures, if I can get the actual pictures of myself, oh I'll put my them God. on there, but I Googled some pictures. There's a vein that kind of goes down the back of your down your skull right and at the back kind of close to where your neck would start it splits into two and it kind of does like a almost like a horseshoe type of thing but like the or wishbone type of thing um so it has the oh, two yeah. things and then then one at center and where mine curve mine get very very narrow and on my right side it was incredibly incredibly narrow and what happens is that's your spinal fluid and your brain fluids and so that's mm. supposed to drain out into your body and mine couldn't so there was a lot of pressure and so what they've done is they've taken and they've taken i forgot a, a very important part of the story which is they've taken a <laughs> they've taken a stent and they've put it to increase the size of that vein in my head right so that i can drain the fluid can drain out of my brain okay now the brain drain yeah sure two parts of the story was one bex and i decided to look up what was put into my brain um <laughs> and bex's first response was it looks like vaginal mesh and i was like <laughs> you're a bitch <laughs> well i mean i you were like i you look i don't want to look and i was like i'll look i'll look i'll look at them all and it was it, yeah it kind of looks like a throat a little bit or you know a cavity of some sort yeah. And so in my brain, this, in my idea of what that was going to happen, like I always thought that this was going to be like a straw size and like maybe like an inch or two like straw. <laughs> and so my fear, like you're laughing because you know what happens. My fear was that I was going to sneeze it out. Um, and so 
I decided to ask my doctor because one, I figured he was going to confirm what I already knew, which was it's going to be like an inch to two inches. And he, I asked him, I was like, well, how big is it? And this motherfucker is starting <laughs> to tell me in millimeters. And he's like, oh, it's like, just like a, whatever millimeters. And I looked at him and I was like, oh, so it's really small because I assume millimeters. millimeters. Yeah, it's little, right? That's going to be little. It wasn't. And he was like, he basically was just like, yeah, it's like that long. And I was like, (laughs) so they put essentially a six inch. Never has six inches felt so big. I know. Well, okay. I won't say which friend it is, but one of my (laughs) friends, my message and the horror that I'm feeling of that we're going to put a six inch stent in my brain. And she's just like, well, you've had six inches in you before. You'll take it like a champ. (laughs) And you're a bitch. So. She's still got it, folks. And, and this is why people wonder, like, why I can be cold and closed off. I'm like, these are the friends that I have. One is like vaginal mesh. <laughs> one makes fun of me. So. But yeah, so. basically, it's you know some kind of meshy. Like if you rolled up some chain link fence, you know. Kind it's... Of. Yeah, and then about six inches of that, and they put it in my vein in my head. And so now. This is the kind of thing it's, it's, I don't know. It's crazy to me. You've been, so basically you've been living with this your whole life and now the pressure has sort of built up to a problem or they've noticed that it's a problem and they're able to correct it. So now it should be brand new Jackie. We don't know if I've been living with with this my whole life. So it's very possible I have been living, like I was just born this way. It's also just possible that environmental factors like I've had a neuropathy from having pneumonia too many times Mm -hmm. I have had multiple concussions so is there something else that could have happened to kind of create this problem yeah Mm -hmm. could I've been born this way yeah like could I you know could have drug I have taken 10 years ago done it like there's we don't really know so I just (gasps) <laughs> was on un- it's it's unlikely that please don't mm-hmm. but you the- you're like predisposed to it perhaps and it's like it's pro- it's just something that whatever the case your body my body created just these decided. circumstances it's like cancer it just some people get something and some people don't you know there's no rhyme or reason like i'm i'm sure i'm predisposed to it because i have multiple multiple chronic illnesses um so yeah. Is it surprising that something else is fucking broken on me? No, it's not surprising at all, but um, it just is a, a web of medical mysteries. Yeah, that's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> but look, one solved. That's great. Well, here's that's the thing. So this might not be the last part. This is going to be the last part before we put out the episode, but I have to wait six months. So I'm on blood thinners for another six months. <laughs> so I really should stop cliff diving, but will I? No one knows. Um, and then we have to do another MRI. So actually I will show, I'll try to show the before and after. So they're doing an MRI with contrast, which shows the veins, how big they are. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they'll do that again in six months and we'll see if one, if my brain has accepted it and taken it and that's all good and nothing's wrong there. The other part that we have to do is now I have to go with my back to my op- neuro ophthalmologist because this was all done by a neurologist. Now I have to go back to my neuro ophthalmologist and he has to check my eye pressures to make sure that this has solved the problem. And so hopefully we'll see that, that it solves the problem. If not, I get to do this part two on the left side of my brain. Um, and if not, then I either eventually go blind uh, or we do a manual surgery. And um, <laughs> that's uh, not exactly what I'm hoping for. But if that's my reality, I have, you know. I have the tools to overcome it. I just prefer not to. Yeah. As the individual experiencing it, it's, it's such a lot for a human brain to have to process the wonder that is our body. And it's honestly kind of, I don't know. It's just such a amazing thing to think about. Sometimes every day we wake up, how many things go right for our bodies to work. Yeah. And I think we take it for granted, right? I've had this conversation with a lot of people recently about, 
why I'm always like pressed for time and like stressed out and trying to accomplish so much. And I think it's because I do feel like I have less time because of having these problems. Like I am really grateful for any time I have and I want to, I want to make the most of it. Um, And there is one other thing I also want to say that I'm super grateful for, which was, you know, shout out to my surgeon. Like he had amazing bedside manner. Like that is, Mm not common and I have definitely had surgeons I very much didn't like but they did their job um but my surgeon was really fantastic and I was you know just really really grateful to have him through the experience and then I had three male nurses which was like new I I don't think I've ever had all male nurses that took care of me and were just phenomenal we're just like totally amazing people like one came in and talked to me about cloning for a while oh one was, okay one was definitely a gay boy and I loved him and <laughs> one was um as I found out like he had this like I guess national um certification and neurological you know um ICU training and so just really really phenomenal people I was so grateful for all of them. Um, and so I also, you know, I always want to give a shout out to like, you know, the, the care teams. Um, and they really make the difference. And when you're going through something like this and just, you're just done, you're just done. So I'm yeah. sure enough cannot be said about the good people in the medical field. And of course, not all of them, you know, some people are just doing their job and that also counts. And some people also are misinformed and not doing their job for some reason, but to all the, the great servants out there in the, field of medicine what a what a gift they are truly seriously like honestly like I could not be more grateful like when you're going through this type of stuff and I have had amazing doctors who were very kind and loving and and basically changed my world I have had doctors who were amazing at their job but with no bedside banner was also (laughs) very grateful for them but like the ones that can do it all that can do both sides of that coin I'm always really really impressed by because it's just that takes a lot of empathy along with a lot of like you know like tough stomach to like you know have these conversations with people all the time so yeah yeah Um, But that was, you know, I wanted to give it a little top off. We're definitely, we'll do a follow up on what what happens next. We'll do that in like six Six months follow up. Yeah, we got to we got to know our prognosis a bit better. Well, is there anything? Is there anything you feel like we have any terrain we haven't covered yet? Anything that this experience has left you with now that you're kind of finally in the on the other side of it? I, I think there's a couple things. One advocacy. Um, you know what, like be your own advocate. If you cannot be your own advocate, bring somebody with you that can, um, take Mm. notes, ask questions. If something doesn't feel right, ask more, um, with my surgeon in particular, I had been like, I I had had conversations with him and I felt very comfortable with him. I felt like, I felt like he was honest and I felt like he was a good Mm. guy and I'm an empath and I'm Wiccan. And so those things are very important to me. And so, he was like, oh, well, it'll either be me or somebody else on the day of your surgery. And, and this was in our initial talks. And I was like, I, I would prefer to stay with you. Um, and that was, you know, I'm not mm. used to asking for things, but I asked for that. And he was my surgeon both times. And, you know, advocate for yourself. And again, like, if you cannot do that, bring somebody with you. It's incredibly hard for me to ask for help. I had to have my therapist, like, basically forced me to bring my family to some of these things with me. <laughs> um in the spinal tap, like I had to, I normally would have done that by myself and I had family bring me and it, it really changed it. So that piece of, of advocacy, advocate for yourself, advocate for others, be there for somebody else if they need it. Um, and then the other thing is perspective. A good, um, a good friend of mine who is a nurse practitioner at the beginning of all of this, finding out that I was going to have surgery told me, um, <clears throat> you know, I can look at all the data, I can look at all the studies, and I can tell you the numbers, but that's not going to change anything for you, Jackie. Like, you need to focus on your mindset. You know, mm-hmm. like the the studies show that the biggest difference that that people experience coming out of surgery and healing is is having a positive mindset wow. and focusing on that and that that piece of focusing on the positive and the bright. And there's gratitude within these horrible experiences. I have had an opportunity to see my family grow when I got sick in my 20s. Um, 
my mom was didn't respond the way that I had wanted her to. Not that she responded badly, but it wasn't the way that I wanted it. And my brother really struggled with it and, and didn't respond in the way that I wanted either. Um, this time around, we have worked through that and I asked them to respond in particular ways and they did and were there for me in the ways that I asked. And that's a lot of gratitude. And you can look at these days and you can think of why it sucks and why you're so unlucky and, and why life is so hard on you. And you can also take it from that perspective of like, I am so lucky to have this time. I am so lucky to be, look at my life with perspective in a different way. Like I'm so lucky to have family with me. Um, and I think that's really it. Like it's fight for yourself, fight for others, ask others to fight for you and, and remember, like focus on the positive, stay strong. Like if you're ever going through things like this, like it's so much mind over matter and it's hard to believe when your body isn't working the way that you want it to, but it truly, truly is. Like I've overcome crazy, crazy stuff with illnesses and I truly believe it's because my mind was there and mind wanted to. That is a, a big piece of things that I'm sure it can also feel frustrating in it in the moments when you just want to have that well-deserved moment of giving up a little bit and not being in good mood and not putting in one more ounce of, you know, your efforts for this thing that isn't your fault and isn't fair to you. But well, as I just have a partner. You've seen it. <laughs> you saw it like, right. You saw it when I had to, to do it. Yeah, and I am. I am so proud of you, and I'm so glad that you are here and that you're healthy. And we're gonna keep fighting. We there's no other choice. As I've always said, I'm too (laughs) stupid to quit. So um, (laughs) I would love to have a different phrase, but you know, like I'm just I'm not willing to stop. And you know, I gratitude. You know, and I've had days like. I've had days where I sat here and I could not get out of bed and I didn't know what to do and you got to let yourself have those days. And then some days you (laughs) focus on the positive and you know what you do when you really panic? Because if we all remember the timing really accurately, the (laughs) podcast really came out of me finding out that I had to have brain surgery. Uh, That timing lined right up because I... I needed something to do. And I had a good friend who was uh, willing to go on a journey with me because I didn't want to mentally go on a different journey. (laughs) Well, a creative outlet, you know, that's maybe that's another little piece of the silver lining is it kind of pushes you to find those things to reach for those things that are inside of you. And why wait, do it now, do it now. Um, and that's also how we went to Mexico. So you know what? We're, li- <laughs> we're living a good life. Um, I think that's all I have on um, my brain surgery episode. But I think we'll come back. We'll let people know how I go. And if you – okay, I was about to make a really morbid joke about if you stop hearing this podcast and I probably Jackie. die. <laughs> But if I die, Rebecca will keep this podcast out going in our name, okay? We are not turning this into a true crime. What really happened to Jackie? (laughs) There were so many hits in the podcast. (laughs) All right. Um, I would say are we experts now, but we both know I'm the only expert on this one. (laughs) And may, may you never need to be an expert on subjects like these if you don't have to. That was great. And that was the show. Thank you everyone for watching and we hope you stay curious. If you enjoyed this video, watch our other videos here on YouTube, or you should listen to the episode on We're Experts Now podcast. Bex, where can they find us? You can find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeart Music. And what if they want to talk to us? If you have ideas for something you want us to investigate, send us an email at we'reexpertspod at gmail.com. That's W-E-R-E-E-X-P-E-R-T-S-P-O-D at gmail.com. Great job on that spelling, A+. Do you do this professionally? I believe we're both doing it professionally right now. Wow. People should know about this. I completely agree. And you can find us on Instagram at We're Experts Now Pod. Thanks again. And if you enjoy the show, subscribe and comment. And do not forget to leave a five-star tip. That's a great idea. Are you a podcast expert? I think we both are. I think we're we're experts experts now. now.
This has been a Just Being Better Media production.